Mitsubishi Triton is one of two 4x4 utes that I routinely recommend. And this one is even better than before thanks to a recent midlife makeover. Let's jump into all the details next. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au, the place where Australian new car buyers save thousands off their next new cars. Hit me up on the website for that. The Triton is number three 4x4 ute in the country behind the Hilux and Ranger, but ahead of the Holden Colorado. And this latest facelift took place just before Christmas, so the vehicle scraped in onto Santa's nice list after all, which must feel great. I mean, I wouldn't know. The badge itself, okay, the Triton nameplate, is an incredible 40 years of age. It turned 40 in September last year, and in that time around the world, they have managed to make an incredible 4.7 million units. And any way you carve that up, you have to call it a profound automotive success. Let's go for a spin. The first thing you need to know about the Triton is it has a nice tractable 2.4 litre turbo diesel engine. The headline acts there 133 kilowatts at 3,500 RPM and 430 Newton metres at 2.5. Now if you understand the relationship between torque and revs, that peak torque spec is about the same as 112 kilowatts at 2.5. So any time you're above about 1750 or thereabouts, this thing goes pretty strong. And I've got a comment for all of you pub experts out there who from time to time get in the comments feed and opine to me that, ah oh, mate, she just wound up a bit too high for a two and a half litre. That's too much. It's not 1976 anymore, okay? And these goalposts that you've put in place mentally that's about where they are mired, all right? This thing is just fine in comparison with other leading engines in this class. And I'd suggest the Mazda 2.2 litre diesel is kind of like that. And the Hyundai Kia 2 litre and 2.2 litre diesels, they make about the same specific engine power output as well. So these criticisms of the size and the output are completely off the reservation they're totally misplaced and the differential diagnosis of that of course is that there is no epidemic of 2.4 litre diesel Mitsubishi engines in the Triton Ute failing out there in service and this thing's been running around in this kind of trim since about 2015 in the current generation of Triton and it is just fine so take your criticisms and teleport them back to 1976 where they belong. On the totally good news front for the powertrain, of course, there is a six-speed transmission now and not a five-speed. So keeping up with the Joneses, yeah, we've done that. And happily enough, I can report that this six-speed auto is really well integrated with the engine, and that would be around town and on the highway. It doesn't hunt around the place the way the recent six-speed integration with the D-Max does, for example. So there's that. And if if I had to criticise the new gearbox just this much, it would be that around town from time to time when you're slowing down, typically uphill at very low speeds and the transmission seems to select second from third or even first from second in that really low speed slowing down sort of context, sometimes that shift is perceptible and just this much harsher than maybe it should have been. But aside from that, I've got to say, she's all good. The one technical thing that impresses the crap out of me with Triton is just down here, well, it's accessible just down here, the rotary dial that gets your hands on the Super Select 2 transfer case. And you might go, yeah, rotary four-wheel drive selector, so what? To which I would retort, 
it's not very often that you'll find yourself in a ute that allows you to select four-wheel drive mode on a high traction surface. And the reason Super Select 2 allows you to do that is because there's a center differential and you can unlock it, which is absolutely brilliant on a high traction surface. So if you've got old agricultural style four-wheel drive system, which you get in most other utes and the lesser tritons, let's not forget, you can't do this because the front and the rear prop shafts are locked together and they rotate at synchronous speed. So if you're on a high traction surface, you drive around a bend, the front end goes through a different path than the rear end. And if you lock those two shafts together, they operate with an incredible amount of stress relative to one another because of that desire to rotate at different rates, which they can't do. In Super Select 2, with the center diff unlocked, you can absolutely do that. You can do it all day long. You can do it for the life of the vehicle but it's a real advantage in some situations. For example, if you're on an alpine road, middle of winter, high traction surface, she's all good. And then all of a sudden you drive around a bend and you get into one of those crevasses that is in perpetual shade. The temperature's below zero and all of a sudden you're driving on a bit of black ice. Oops a daisy, wasn't expecting that. That can get very interesting, and in that situation, I'd rather have some of the front end doing the driving as well. Not only is it going to be less interesting, it's also going to be a whole lot safer. And there's situations in the outback like this all the time, right? You'll be on a dirt road, and it'll be a good dirt road. Lots of traction. In most utes, you're going to have to be in rear wheel drive mode only. It's going to be irresponsible, risking breaking the transmission to engage four wheel drive in that situation. In this thing, no problem. Four wheel drive, centered if unlocked, and then the minute you go around a bend and you encounter that bit of ball bearing gravel right on the apex, thanks a lot, or a bit of mud, or a bit of bull dust, whatever it is that saps traction away from you in that situation, then, hey, all of a sudden the front end's doing some of the driving here. You are in a much more stable, safer position, which is absolutely brilliant. And you also get these selectable modes that go with different kinds of off-road terrain as well when you're in low range. And that's more to do with the uh, control of the wheel slip, you know, the traction control system. Basically, some types of terrain like sand, for example, a little bit of wheel slip is a good idea in sand, whereas when you're in rock hopping sort of terrain, wheel slip is generally a huge disadvantage over that rock hopping stuff because if the wheel starts to spin, usually it's in the air, so you want to constrain that. And when you select those modes in low range in this vehicle, you can tweak the uh, wheel slip control to give you optimal traction as well. So this is a pretty advanced high-tech system and it is a real plus compared with the vast majority of competing utes out there on the market and lesser Tritons as well, let's not forget. When you talk about performance and refinement and all that stuff, it has to be in context, right? And in this case, in the context of other utes. And with that in mind, I'd say eight and a half out of 10 everywhere. Noise, vibration and harshness, ride and handling, ergonomics, driveline performance, all of that stuff compared with other utes, Triton is absolutely up there. However, I'd love to sit here and say, well, that's the same as other vehicles as well, and if you're thinking about buying a vehicle for the family, you don't specifically need a ute, but you've always wanted one, and everyone seems to be buying them now, <laughs> which they do, then I'd have to suggest that there is a fundamental trade-off in the context of things like value and refinement when you buy a ute, because if you compare it with something that would be a similar cost, like a Sorento or a Santa Fe or a CX-9, one of those vehicles like that, that you might also purchase to transport the family and do the domestic running around, do the school run and go down to Bunnings at the weekend and all that stuff, then value is going to be better 
if you buy an SUV, a wagon style SUV. It's going to be more car like to drive as well, which means ultimately a lot more pleasant. You know, what you get when you buy something like a Triton is you do take a hit in fundamental refinement, but what you get is really serious all-terrain performance, right? You get heavy towing performance as well, so that is a real plus if you need those things. But if you wake up one day and you just go, might buy myself a ute, always wanted a ute, don't need one, always wanted one. Plenty of people do this increasingly. There's been, you know, stratospheric growth in the sale of utes and they're not all going to people who are tradies or they need them to cart heavy materials around and stuff like that. People are just buying them because they want utes and if you are one of those people you must acknowledge at least objectively one of the trade-offs there is going to be on that refinement noise vibration and harshness and also value side of the equation it's not going to be as attractive but hey if you want a ute you've always wanted one and now you finally decided to buy one all good just acknowledge up front that that is the cost of doing this Let me detain you briefly with the elephant in the room, the front end, the styling of which Mitsubishi calls dynamic shield, which to me, and I don't normally comment on styling, right? Because you've got eyes and presumably they work. But to me, it's all a little bit mighty morphin power rangers. And I know I say that like it's a bad thing, but let me just remind you, despite the advancing age of the power rangers, they were teenagers when the show kicked off in 1993, so they must be older than the Triton badge now. But let me just remind you, Amy Jo Johnson, pink jumpsuit, yes. Now, in relation to this whole dynamic shield styling concept. Many of you flat out hated that if your response to my recent video on the fuel shutoff thing, link up there somewhere, was anything to go by. Let's for balance though just hear what Mitsubishi has to say about dynamic shield. They say it gives expression both to the powerful performance sought in a pickup truck and to the peace of mind that stems from its role in protecting both vehicle and occupants. Yes, but wait, there's more. They go on to claim the result is a new look front face that embodies the engineered beyond tough development key phrase through its imposing road presence and sense of dependable reliability. Well, with that in mind, let's do a scientific experiment of sorts with Dynamic Shield and just give it a bit of a, a brush up, a touch up, some hair and makeup perhaps, and you can let me know what you think. Just to be aware though, Mitsubishi is going to possibly crack the, um, crack the, crack the shits, which is a uniquely Australian expression for being immensely displeased because they hate, you know, people such as me taking liberties with their styling. But stand by. I didn't have particularly high expectations going into this segment in the review, but I must say it's come up slightly better than I had hoped. Who cares what I think though? I mean, styling's so subjective. What matters is what you think. Which exercise is superior? The auto expert, slightly less dynamic shield, what I call attenuated dynamic shield or the full-blown Mitsubishi Motors Corporation Mighty Morphin dynamic shield. Who got it right? Tell me below. And Christ knows, if I get sufficiently positive response, I might sell it as a kit and start my second YouTube channel, stylingexpert.com.au. I've always wanted to do that. Hit me up on the website for that. Another bucket list item crossed off thanks to the high-tech miracle of YouTube. Some 
unkind people occasionally suggest that I am merely an habitual taker of the piss over everything, and hey, maybe that's true. But let's change the tone of conversation down here at the blunt end and cover something far more serious, which would be towing. And if you're looking at a dual cab ute, that makes sense from a heavy tow perspective because you can get real heavy tow capacity at a much lower price point than a vehicle like a Land Cruiser 200. So this class of vehicle makes sense. And if you're checking out the specs to try and make some objective determination about which one is better, then you might look at the tow capacities and say Triton 3.1 tonnes. And why is that so when just about every other dual cab ute on the market seemingly is up at three and a half tonnes, which is a significant disparity. And what's underdone about the Triton? That would be a reasonable conclusion to draw in the circumstances, all right? So let me just refer to my notes here because things are not exactly as they seem and I wanna get the numbers absolutely bang on. So 3.1 tonnes of tow capacity, 5,885 kilos of gross combination mass limit. Now, if you don't know what gross combination mass is, it's the combination of the total loaded weight of the vehicle and the total loaded weight of the trailer. The limit there, 5,885 kilos. If you take away the unladen weight of the Triton, which is 2,042 kilos worth of curb weight, you get 3,843 kilos. And if you take the 3.1 tonne trailer weight limit off the back of that, you are left with 743 kilos of payload capacity. And I'd suggest that's reasonable because you've got five seats there, so you could have five people on board. You might have some accessories fitted to the vehicle, the tow bar, obviously. You might have a bull bar up the other end, and you might be carrying a little bit of stuff in the tray as well. 743 kilos worth of payload is what you are left with if you put a 3.1 tonne trailer behind this vehicle. Now, Someone down the pub might say, mate, Ranger, three and a half tonnes. So here's how that plays out. Your Ford Ranger Wild Track, 3.2 litre, five cylinder automatic, all right? It's got a 6,000 kilogram gross combination mass. And if you take away the unladen weight of the Ranger, 2,278 kilos, and you take away the three and a half ton trailer that you are also notionally allowed to tow with a Ranger, 222 kilos is all that is left in a payload capacity for your Ranger Wild Track. And you think about that, if you've got you and your wife and some luggage and a small amount of gear stowed wherever in the vehicle. It doesn't take a great deal of time to exceed that 222 kilogram payload capacity for the Ranger. So I'd suggest that if we do a apples for apples comparison here and you put a 3.1 tonne trailer behind your Ranger Wild Track, then you're, you've got another 400 kilos worth of payload capacity suddenly in the Ranger. And how this plays out is 743 kilograms for the Triton with a 3.1 tonne trailer and 622 kilos for the Ranger. So even though notionally the specs say 3.1 tonnes versus 3.5 for every other dual cab ute on the market, in reality, the Triton is absolutely up there from a heavy tow ability point of view. And the concept of towing a three and a half ton trailer with any dual cab ute has all kinds of caveats and restrictions built in. And I could easily make the case that doing so at 3.5 tons is insane. Just a few important details now before I let you go. From the domain of pub trivia championships, you need to know that Triton was a Greek god, the messenger of the sea, of course, with the torso of a man and the ass of a fish. <laughs> so about as plausible as any other god, really, now that I think about it. And obviously a great deal of ouzo was consumed in the determination of all these gods back then. And I'm not sure how it was hijacked later for automotive use. 
On the plus side, back in the domain of the real world, really good engine and driveline on this vehicle, particularly with that new six-speed auto. Super Select 2 is a brilliant transfer case in GLS and GLS Premium. The relative value proposition, very strong as well, like 62 grand for a Ford Ranger Wildtrak and just 52 for a Triton GLS Premium. That's both before on-road costs here in Shitsville. And I have to say that 10,000 bucks that you save, it's going to buy you quite a few off-road adventuring accessories if that's why you're procuring a vehicle like this. One of the things we have not yet spoken about is the active safety upgrades for 2019. Mitsubishi calls that ADAS, the driver assistant stuff, right? Which is kind of an add-on in the lower grades and standard higher up in the range. They sometimes also call it MyTech as well for Mitsubishi Motors intuitive technology. Obviously, they could not find a home for one of the M's in that acronym, but I never saw a marketing dude who was stopped by such a triviality. It really is acronym overload in the safety domain, so brace for impact there in the spec sheets and the brochure. Forward collision, mitigation, blind spot warning, lane change assist, rear cross traffic alert, ultrasonic miss, acceleration, mitigation, systems. Ums, of course. Look. In perspective, this safety tech is great, potentially, and it might save your life or someone else's, and if it does, hey, big tick from me. But the implementation, in my view, is at times fairly crap, and Mitsubishi is not alone here, not by a long shot. It's like the engineers are all being marched around by a bunch of lawyers. There are so many false positive warnings with this stuff that it becomes just intrusive and kind of meaningless and you just ignore much of it. For example, if I am flying a Black Hawk helicopter and there's some threat like, I don't know, some mother lover, he locks us up with surface to air missile radar, that's bad. I would want to be warned and I would want it to be definite and unequivocal. And I'm sure you would want this too. But if that warning goes off every few minutes for seemingly no good reason, whenever we are airborne in our Black Hawk on every flight, well, it's just not going to be very useful, is it? You're either going to tune it out or turn it off. And that kind of sucks when a bad guy actually does draw a bead upon you. And this is kind of that, right? The tech is good, but the implementation is a bit sucky. The HMI team really needs to work a lot harder to reduce the incidence of false positives. And it's not just the Triton, it's an automotive thing currently. Rant over. Let us talk about the competitors now. Hilux. It's the king of mediocrity in my view. It's overpriced and there's still no native Apple or Android phone support. And the recent 2.8 DPF reliability fiasco and the way Toyota handled that, well, that really put a dent in Hilux for me. And if you want to be part of Club Hilux, and it's kind of a big club out there in the bush, go ahead, knock yourself out. Hilux is insanely popular, and you will not have to justify buying it to anyone. And the service and support network is pretty good, the best in the outback, certainly, so there's that. Ranger, Colorado, and Amarok, okay? If it's confession time, then I must confess to you that I really like the look of all three and the way they drive. I really do, but there's more to ownership than just styling and driving, isn't there? And the grim fact here is that Ford, Holden, and Volkswagen are the three horsemen of the customer support apocalypse. You just have to look at the damning overload of evidence, much of it accessible in just a few clicks on the ACCC's website. I strongly suggest you do that. The only prudent advice I can give you with Ranger Colorado and Amarok is look, but don't touch, like the boss's secretary. That's at least if you know what's good for you in both cases. Like, all vehicles have problems, okay, from time to time, but I must say it's kind of nice not to be crucified when they do, and that's the risk. The D-Max, well, it's just like a brand new 10-year-old Colorado. It's the cougar of utes, of Colorados, whatever. The support network is pretty tiny and, frankly, not that enthusiastic if you actually present with a concern. 
Overhyped legendary truck reliability. I mean, please. Navara, it's a maybe, but the higher end models have this multi-link rear end that essentially Mercedes-Benz demanded for the X-Class platform which is shared between those vehicles. And that rear end is great if you never carry, carry or cavy, whatever, haul a heavy load or tow anything heavy. But it lets Team Navara down very badly if you do, and the turning circle is comparatively appalling too. Nissan customer support is not quite as bad as Volkswagen, Ford and Holden, but it's still quite some way from being excellent. And up until recently, a three-year warranty. That just changed today as I'm recording this. If you needed evidence of Nissan's post-GFC brain damage, the delay there is Exhibit A. Basically, Triton's a well-thought-out package at a great value price point for a ute. It doesn't give much trouble in service. I get hardly any Triton complaints. And I must say that when I do get the odd owner that a dealer has dropped the ball on, historically, Mitsubishi's been pretty good. They've gotten on it and they've fixed the problem. Triton has a great warranty, which is currently seven years thus far for 2019, or 150,000 Ks. So there's that. That's a plus as well. And I also kind of like it how the Triton manages to be popular and successful without making borderline misrepresentative claims about things like its towing prowess. And trust me that 3.1 tonnes is far more realistic than the 3.5 tonne bullshit claims peddled by competitors. So, if you need a ute or if you just want a ute, that's quite okay too. The Triton really does stack up on objective criteria. I recommend that you also test drive a Mazda BT50 for comparison value. It's got slightly more grunt and somewhat less advanced in the driveline, but everything else is pretty much a subjective determination. They're equally attractive, if you ask me. Do let me know also in the comments below if I actually improved the styling of the Triton with a roll of masking tape at the roadside. And if I did, well, aesthetics is probably not going to be an entry in the plus column, is it? Still, it's all eye of the beholder stuff. You might decide that it is actually mighty morphin time after all. And if so, I've got some leftover tape if you need it for my patented anemic shield front end conversion, cyan shield, whatever. Amy Jo Johnson's pink jumpsuit is not included, sadly, except of course, if you're a subscriber, in which case anything goes. Another excellent reason to smash that subscribe button and click the bell while you're uh, down there. I would really enjoy that. I love that bell. Good luck on the hunt for the right ute. It can be quite an exhausting process. Triton is frankly one of the best choices you can make in this class. That is absolutely certain. I hope this helps. Thanks for watching.